Hello and welcome to this introduction to Autodesk Maya. My name is Hudele, I'm a teacher at Digital Arts and Entertainment and I'm going to I'm going to show you an introduction on how to work with the modeling tools of Maya. Um, but first I will talk a little bit about what is Autodesk, um, what is high poly modeling, low poly modeling. And yeah, that's what I'm going to do. All right. Um, so I'm going to go over the interface. I'm also going to show you the basic primitives, which is basically your they are basically your starter shapes. You can make any model with these basic primitives, but you'll see what that means later. Um, then you have modeling tools, uh, which I will explain afterwards. And then I will show you how to render your newly created 3D model. Um, so Autodesk. Autodesk is kind of the mother company of Maya. It's also the mother company of 3ds Max. Um, of Shotgun, of Fusion, it, it actually has a lot of programs. Programs, um, The programs can actually be divided in three subjects. So you have the architecture and engineering. So you've probably heard of AutoCAD before. Um, then you have product design. Um, and then you also have the media and entertainment collection, which is where we come in. Um, so personally, I like using Maya. I think it's one of the greatest modeling softwares, but that's probably simply because I'm used to it the most. When I worked in a company, we used Maya all the time and I've gotten really used to it. I really like the way their menus work. Um, but if you're really used to say Blender or 3ds Max, that's probably going to be your, your software that you're attached to the most. Um, Maya is a bit hard to learn because it's a very deep program. Um, it has a lot of stuff. <laughs> you can do a lot of things with it. Um, you have simulations, animations, rigging. Uh, you can do a lot of different subjects with it, um, which makes it difficult to learn. So the, learnings, the learning curve is kind of steep. Um, but also it can be a little bit buggy sometimes, <laughs> which you will probably notice the second that you'll start working in it. But all 3D, uh, all 3D modeling softwares are, um, they all have their quirks. So this is also a question that I get a lot. Why don't we use Blender? Because Blender is free and it's so awesome. Um, but the thing is, Maya is an industry standard right now for animation. It's probably going to be in the industry for quite a long time. Blender is also awesome. <laughs> Both softwares are really great, actually. Um, and you could probably go on and discuss the pros and cons until eternity. So let's not do that. Um, if you know the basics of low poly of, or high poly modeling, for that matter, then it's transferable to different kinds of software, which is great if you know how to model in Maya. It's just, it's going to take you a little time to learn to model in Blender, but at least you know all the principles already. Um, so about those principles, here you see two examples of models. On the left, you see one with a wireframe that is not very dense. Um, and here you see one with a wireframe that is very dense. So we're going to call this one low poly and we're going to call the other one high poly. It just has a higher poly count. And that's basically what it means. This is low poly count, high poly count. Um, the amount of edges that you see here, you can see there's a lot, so meaning high poly. Um, I think this kind of speaks for itself. So why are we still going to use low poly now that our computers are handling quite a bit of information and we've got the new Unreal Engine 5 coming on? Well, we still have something like uh, mobile games and we have VR, uh, which does not handle a high poly count quite yet. So we still have to be able to work in a low poly count. Um, it's going to be very useful in many cases. So. It's also a better way to start out learning how to model because you don't have to uh, be worried about all of these segments. You only have to worry about like three points instead of 400. Um, so it's also a good way to start with your 3D modeling process. Um, all right, let's get to Maya. 
So here you see Maya. Um, it might be that it looks different on your end. Um, so what you can do is change uh, your type of workspace. So if you go to Windows and you choose Workspaces, you can choose all of these different subjects um, in they're probably going to correspond to what you're doing in Maya. So say that I'm modeling, I'm obviously going to choose one of these modeling um, workspaces. If I'm sculpting, I want to choose this one. Or if I'm rigging or animating, rendering, they all have their according uh, workspace, which is very nice to navigate quickly through the different um, editors. Um, so let's choose modeling standards. Um, you can choose Maya Classic as well. That's also a good one, but I dig the standard one because it has your outliner and the outliner is very important because this is basically a lineup of every little thing that's in your scene, which is obviously nothing right now. But the second that we're going to create some models here, then you'll start to see things popping up in here. Um, another important thing to notice is that you have this ribbon here, you have all of these different buttons here. They don't explain a lot, um, but that's because they are quick menus. Um, these are very handy for to just really quickly go to and click on if you know what they are. Um, but they also, you can also find all of these things um, in these menus at the top. So in here you have the poly modeling tab and in there you can find your primitives so you can see some different shapes in here but you can also find the same thing in the create tab and you can go to polygon primitives and here you find the exact same things so let's let's just go ahead and do that and create some primitive shapes i'm gonna go in create and i'm gonna say polygon primitives and i'm going to press the double dotted line um, just so that this menu is staying here for a while now, which is pretty neat. Um, so just drag it somewhere where it's handy for you. Um, I'm going to put it here and let's just have some fun with these primitive shapes. So as I said before, primitive shapes are actually starter shapes. Um, if you want to model a barrel, for instance, then it's going to be really handy to start working with the cylinder. Um, but if you want to create a box, for example, then of course a cube is going to be very handy. So these are things um, that you can choose according to the model that you're going to make. But in most cases, it will be the standard cube here. Before we create our primitives, it is of course very handy to know how to move around in the viewport, um, for which we are going to use our three mouse buttons and the button Alt. So Alt plus left mouse button is rotating. Alt plus your middle mouse button is moving. So you can move your viewport around. And Alt plus your right mouse button is panning, so it's kind of like zooming in and out. So try to get used to this as soon as possible. This will probably feel a little bit stubborn if you're used to different modeling softwares. So I'm just going to repeat Alt left mouse button is rotating, Alt middle mouse button is moving, and Alt left mouse button is zooming in and out. But just scrolling your wheel also works uh, for zooming in and out. So you have two options for that one. But this one with the right mouse button is a little bit more precise than the zooming because you have sort of a step uh, going on here. And right now we can begin to create our basic shapes. So I'm going to start with a cube, which is basically the starting point for many, many models. Um, and when I click this, I automatically see a cube appear here. Um, so the fact that it's appearing here, or if you see nothing, it all has to do with this option here. If your interaction, if your interactive creation is turned on or off, so if it's turned on, you're going to have to click and drag your cube. But if this option... But if that option is turned off, then your cube is just going to appear and you'll have to change the settings later on. So that's a big difference. 
Um, let's go for interactive creation. So I'll toggle that on and I'll create my cube and I'll just click and drag for the ground plane and I click and drag to set my height. And then I can also click and drag to set my amount of subdivisions. So let's keep it low. So I'm going to give all of them a subdivision <laughs> and now my cube is created. So I can still edit these, uh, these subdivisions. I can also edit the scale still. Um, I can do that in my channel box. So if you do not have the same interface as I do, um, if you don't see your channel box slash layer editor, you can still go to windows and go to general editors and there you'll find a channel box right here. So it's just windows, general editors, and then you find channel box. And once you have that one, you can see here the name of your cube. It's called polycube one. And you just click it after you, you open it, you can still adjust height. So you can click some of these and you can enter different numbers and you will see that it changes. I can make the perfect cube now by entering 20, 20, 20. And I can also still adjust my amount of subdivisions, which is great. Um, I also am quickly going to show you how to move it around. So if I want to create more objects, they're going to pop up here and it's not that handy to have a big cube in a way. So these are three buttons that are going to be super important. Um, you're probably not going to forget them because you'll use them all the time. And they are W, E and R. So W is moving your sphere. E is rotating it and R is scaling it. So W, E, R is going to let you toggle between those three moduses, modi, I don't know. Um, so Let's just do that. I'm going to press W and I'm going to press the blue button, move it. So with E, I, I can rotate this, but I can also press R to scale it up and down. And you'll see that these translations, these modifications, that they are added in your channel box right here. So as you can see, I've rotated my Z axis to minus 37. So if I just put that back to zero, then my box is going to be straight again. Um, I can also mess around with the scale. So selecting multiple of these is just using the shift button and clicking more than one. And then you can enter some sort of um, some sort of input. So you can take your time to test all of these out. Um, I would suggest clicking on all of them and just see what they do. Um, and then maybe also going into your channel box and editing some, some subdivisions, some heights, just to get used to uh, what that does and how that feels. Um, Also get used to the moving around. So when you also have selected one of these, you can press the button F. Uh, F stands for focus. So it will focus on that object and will center it in your viewport. So selecting one, pressing F will also make it easier to navigate because that is also the point that it's going to take to navigate. Um, okay. So I'm creating a Taurus. I'm also creating a plane. The disk doesn't have interactive creation, so it just appears here. We have a platonic solid. Um, I've literally never used that one. It's also a very interesting one. It looks like a sphere, but it has a different way of how these wires are going around it. Um, so in most situations, we will simply go with a sphere. I've literally never used this one before. Um, maybe it could be 
could be good for fluid simulations i don't know um pyramid you can also change this pyramid settings oh you can all, only choose these so even even i'm learning today uh prism and you have the pipe which is kind of like a cylinder only that it has an inside so as you can see kind of looks like this uh, and then we have this really fun one the helix so you just create a circle then you pull up the height then you select an amount of coils and then you give it a thickness this is also one that is fun to edit later on when the clicking and dragging will give you a maximum of 20 coils but you can in here manually add way more of them but beware because this model becomes very heavy so the subdivision axes uh, the subdivision coils they're put to 50 so let's lower that quite a bit and you will see that my wireframe becomes way less dense so i'm gonna put this even to uh, five so as you can see the amount of divisions in this uh, type of rotation is now five um, that's pretty low it becomes pretty blocky but in some cases this is enough uh, for low poly modeling um, another fun one is the gear so this is our gear so i'm pressing f to zoom in on it and this is also something that you can edit in the amount of sides so you can make them quite a lot but you can also have like only five sides uh, the radius you can edit uh, actually the inside radius as well so these are all uh, fun little things that you can do um, so you can even give it like a twist or a taper so this is pretty customizable okay so the taper is giving me very strange effects um, let's go lesser then. So it's tapering a little bit inward, but it's also giving me a bit of a faulty mesh. So the mesh is inside out at the bottom here. That's why it's becoming black. So what if we do 1.5? Okay, so that's that's giving me something. 1.5. Um, so these are all really fun little tests that you can do. Um, almost looks like um, like whipped cream <laughs> in some areas um so okay we have tried most of these out we have also a soccer ball we can drag that one on the grid um also something that i'll probably never never use we have the super ellipse um but it it's just a um it looks like a sphere but as you can see it has a lot of settings which i'm not going to go over entirely but as you can see we have a lot of starter shapes and these are way they, they are enough to create any type of model of um so what i'm gonna do is i'll select these now all of them so i can just click drag and they will all be selected if i click next to it they will be deselected so clicking and dragging um and then you can just as you can see here in your outliner they are all here you can just delete them because we're not going to need them for now um So this leads me to the actual exercise and that is we are going to model a toy train. <laughs> um, so I have a little program here that will help me in creating this and it's called PureF. Um, you can go and download it. It's just a program that makes sure that my reference is always put on top. But you can also put reference anywhere, maybe on your second screen. Um, I just think PureRef is really handy because you get to look at your reference all the time, from the beginning to the end. So I just think it's a very useful tool because while you're modeling, one of the most difficult things is uh, getting the proportions correctly. And that's only going to happen when you keep on looking at this um, reference image right here. So go download it. It's also very neat when you're making a drawing or anything like it. Um, right. So you also can right click on this one and say mode always on top, which is uh, handy because when you click on your software, then your reference is not disappearing. So that's why very useful tool. Um, uh, 
and let's just make this straight to begin with so we're just going to safely model all of these parts after each other the first thing the most important thing is just getting the proportions correctly so okay let's start and as i said um we're going to start simple so we're going to create one of these cards at the back which is nice because we can just copy that one um that will be fine um so let's create our cube So rotate around when you create your cube because otherwise um, it, you might create something different than you had intended. Um, and let's go into our channel box. Um, I can still do the click dragging thing. If you do not want to do this, but you want to edit the, the subdivisions later, you can just press Q. So Q is the shortcut for complete tool. Um, then you're done with the creation process and it's finished. It's going to be the same for all the tools that you use in this software. Uh, so just queue uh, when you're done with creating process. Um, right, so the important thing that we're going to do right now is making sure that this is put into the middle. Um, you can also change your perspective by uh, pressing your spacebar and then clicking and dragging to all of these views. So spacebar, clicking, and then going to perspective view, left view, top view, or any of those is going to um, make you go to, uh, say front view, left view, top perspective view. Um, so some people might have started out into this quad view here, um, and then maybe have just Put this to the side but you can also navigate through those uh, cycles here so you can have a two different uh, kind of perspective view you can have four different ones um, but you can also just work with this one and then just press spacebar uh, and go to a different view if you want to go anywhere else also it's pretty sensitive as to where you click and drag because now you have your perspective modes but if you do it on top uh, you also have already different settings at the bottom you'll have more different settings um, but that's something for later uh, you can just click and drag keep it on the maya button and then you'll get to your perspectives um, so it's a very important step that we go into front view and make sure that this object is centered. So what we're going to do is put our Y axis to zero. So that is centered, which is great. Um, I'm also going to center it in this way. So I want it to be on the center here, but I can also just um, put zero here. And it's already on the ground plane, so that is a thing that I'm going to leave as is. Um, I'm just going to start making this inset here, um, which is something that I'm going to do by deleting this top face and then continuing from there. So if you right click on your model, you can go to edge mode, object mode, UV mode, um, multi mode, face, vertex face and vertex so the three ones that we are going maybe the four ones that we're going to use the most are edge mode which allows you to select the edges then you have vertex mode which is allowing you to select these points vertices as we call them and we also have face mode which allows us to select whole faces and then same as uh, before the w e and r will allow us to move rotate and scale them around so if i just um, select w and i move this then i will move the whole face same thing uh, with vertices if i select one If I select one and I move it upwards, then that vertice will move as well, um, which is not a thing that we're going to do right now. We are going to go into face mode. We're going to click this whole face and we're going to delete. So just the delete button will delete this whole face. Now, if you want to go out of sub object mode, so 
That means out of edge mode, vertex mode or face mode. If you want to get out of there, you can just right click and say object mode again. And then you're out of the sub object mode. Um, but now you cannot edit it any further. Okay, so I'm gonna go into sub object mode again and I'm going to select edge. Um, so with edge, I can select these edges, which I can do by just pressing shift and clicking on all four of them. But if it's a loop like here, I can just double click it and it will select also all of these edges. So now a weird thing that maybe may take some time getting used to is you can move verts and in moving them, you can create new verts. So I'm pressing W and I'm going to shift and I'm creating a whole set of new faces. Um, so you can do that with the move tool. Rotate is a bit, uh, un, a bit weird, I guess, but you can also do that with the scaling tool. So I have pressed R for my scaling tool. And as you can see, I have my arrows, like these little blocks, but I also have these um, squares in between. And now I can just shift and go to this green square because that's going to downscale this axis and this one. And I'm just going to shift downscale, which is going to create four new faces. <laughs> and once that's done, you can press W and shift move downwards to create our inner border. So if that doesn't work, say that you've selected these. Okay, let me try to mimic the error. Um, if that doesn't work, it might be that you're shift dragging in edge that's not at the end like this one. If you have by accident two edges at the top of each other and you try to do the shift thing, uh, it's going to give a very strange result. So make sure that you don't have a double edge. You can double check that by selecting either of those and moving it around a bit. And if you want to delete the entire edge, you can say control backspace. Um, and I'm pretty sure for most people, this was working out just fine. So I can select this open edge again, double click. I shift downscale. And now I'm going to press W and shift, move it downwards. So that was the first step. Um, make sure that it's not going through your bottom side like this, we just want to keep a bit of spacing in there. Um, and then we're going to close this up as well. So I'm going to select two opponent edges. I'm selecting this one. I press shift and I click the opposite one like that. And I'm going to do my first modeling thing. Uh, it's the first modeling tool. Um, and you can access that by pressing the shift button, right clicking, and dragging all the way down to bridge. So bridge will build a bridge between <laughs> these two uh, edges really. So I have done that now. And as you can see, it is closed. So for any modeling tool, you can go to shift, right click, and you select any of these options. Um, I'm going to explain, of course, way more of these later, but here you can find all your modeling tools. Um, it's also a very specific way of working with Maya is that you have these menus, they are called marking menus, and that's going to speed up your process quite a bit if you use them from the start, because you don't have to go search in any menus, they are just right here where your mouse is at, which is also very optimal in saving a lot of time. Um, so that was that. I think we have our first little part here, the back part. Um, make sure that the proportions are kind of okay. I think mine is a little bit too thick, um, which is why I'm going to select my faces here. And I'm again going to shift double click. So I have the entire loop and I'm going to scale again 
this time with this yellow one and I'm going to upscale this so that it becomes a little bit finer. As you can see, if I just up or downscale this, I can make this a little bit more thin. You can also scale this entire shape, but beware because these are now thinner than these ones. So in this case, it is better to go in and select vertices with the marquee tool. So clicking and dragging around it and then just moving that whole part and then going back to object mode. So another peculiar thing that you see happening here is this. So everything you do, every every move you make is being recorded by Maya. This is actually your modeling history. And from time to time, you're going to want to delete this um, because this makes your file a lot larger. Um, and if you don't plan on going back to any steps, uh, then I would just make sure that this is deleted. Um, so how to delete that is selecting this object with the history, going to edit, delete by type, and then going delete history. So you can also find a shortcut for that in here. Um, so this middle button at the tab here is delete by type history. So that's already two ways of doing that. You can also press Alt Shift D. And um, that's also going to delete your history. So Alt Shift D, as you can see, will also delete all of that. Uh, for now, it shouldn't be an issue, but in two further steps, um, might be really handy to delete it from time to time. So we're going to create this block right here now. So I'm going to add two edges. Uh, I will do that by uh, selecting all of these ones. So make sure you're looking at it from the top. And when you click and drag over these ones, all of your horizontally aligned edges should be selected. So I can double check that. The oranges are the ones that are selected. We're going to Okay, and now we're going to shift right click and going to the connect tool, which is going to say connect slide. And if I just middle mouse button click and drag, I can up the amount. So middle mouse button, click, drag, and I'm going to add two of these sides. And again, if I want these to be implemented in my model, if I'm done with using this tool, you press Q to apply it. So Q, and then they're going to be stored inside of your model, um, which is nice. Um, so now we can continue working with this face. Um, if for some reason that tool didn't work, I'm just going to show you another way, is you can also select um, edge mode and say insert edge loop tool but in this case they will not be perfectly aligned with each other but they do kind of the same thing so you can do both ways you can select all of the edges um, and work with the connect tool but you can also work with the insert edge tool so connect not connect components just make sure that you have two edges in here um, and then you'll be fine um, the next step that we're going to do is selecting the face here. So again, I'm going to right click, go into face mode. And I'm going to shift, drag this downwards just to create new geometry. And as you can see at the top here, it sticks out a bit. So what I'm going to do is select this face at the front. I'm going to drag that outwards. But now I want the front to be a little bit smaller. So I will again go into edge mode 
and this time I will insert edge loop tool and I will insert an edge here. Voila. So if I'm done with the insert edge loop tool, I can press Q because I don't want to use the tool anymore. And now I'm going to face mode, select these ones, just press the delete button. We don't need them anymore. And now we again have an open, um, an open mesh and I'm going to go in edge mode again and select my opposite edges and you already know this one it's the bridge tool so I can now bridge and again bridge so I can still move this up and down Now, a thing that we're having is it's resting onto this ground plane here. So it's actually going through the floor. So I'm going to move my whole shape upwards and I will guess a little bit where my wheels should go. I think they will come a little bit lower than this bottom part, as you can see in my ref here. So Moving that upwards will help. I also notice um, that this is way wider than it is in my model. So I will also quickly fix that. Um, how I will do that is going into face mode and I will select these three faces here. I will also select them on the opposite side. One, two, three. And I will just go into scaling. So I press R. And now I will scale with this red one and just make that a little bit wider like that so my wheels can come in between here. So another thing that I'm going to do is clean up these edges because I'm actually not using them for anything. So it's better to just get rid of those. If you're not using them, you don't need them for any curvature, for any geometry, then you can just delete them. Um, so the way that I'm going to do that is again into edge mode and I will double click from here to the other side. So double click and it will fill that in. So you can also manually select all of these. And then I just go into shift, right click, delete edge. So if you've missed that step, I'm going to redo it again for the other side. So I click, I go to the other side, I press shift and double click. And now I will again, shift, delete edge, and they are gone. The problem is now that I have a face here that is faulty because it has more than four points. Um, so it is an N-gon. An N-gon is a face with more than four points, which is a thing that you want to avoid because of your computer's calculations to it. Um, so I'm not going to go into depth of what N-gons are right now, um, but just know that they are an incorrect way of modeling. We, we don't really... The computer is going to react bad to them in some cases because it will just figure out a way how to connect these dots and make them four again. But it might not be the way that you actually want it to calculate those quads. So um, what I'm going to do is make this... I'm going to divide this face again. So I'm going to shift right click and I'm going to multi cut. And as you can see, that already gives me some edges. What I'm going to do is click and dragging to the edge. And I'm also going to click and drag to this edge. And when I'm done with that, I press the right mouse button, which allows me to make my next cut. So again, click, Control Z, click and drag to the edge. And here as well, 
click and drag and right click and those are applied. I'm going to do that here as well. Click and drag, right click. And here as well, click and drag, click and drag and right click. So when I'm completely done with this tool, I will again press Q to get out of my multi-cut tool. I'm going into object mode and I will again delete all of this leftover information by going to this button here or pressing Alt Shift Delete. And that is the base for the first part here. So I'm going to create some cylinders here as well. So we already know how to create it uh, with the Create tab. Um, we can also create it using the button here, but I'll show you a third way of creating your primitives. So if you're really into modeling fast and getting getting as fast as possible, you can also just create it into the view viewport here. Um, I'm going to press Shift. I'm going to right click. And now as well, I have the same menu. So I can press Cylinder and we'll say drag the base on the grid, pull up for height. So let me show that again, just shift right clicking in your viewport will also give you a menu of creation, which is the fastest way of doing that. Um, I'm now going to edit this original cylinder. Um, I'm going to go a little bit less than axes. So these rotations, they can only be 12. Um, I'm going to go with zero subdivision caps um, because I do not like the way that it's modeled right now. So I'm just going to go with zero. And I will manually connect these edges because I want quads and I do not want triangles. Um, I think it's a little bit cleaner as well. So what I'm going to do is select one vert and then shift selecting another vert. And again, I'm going to shift right click and say connect. So if that's applied, you can always press Q. And the cool thing is, if you want to repeat any tool, you just select the two next vertices by pressing shift and I just press G. So G is repeating all of the tools. So I still have to press Q afterwards. So I select them, I press G and then I press Q to apply. So let me show that here as well. I can connect these, I press Q. But I can also uh, repeat my tool by pressing G and then Q again. G, Q. So I still have two faces with five. I'm going to quickly multi-cut them. Just again by clicking, dragging and clicking, dragging. Right click, click, drag and click, drag and right click and afterwards I press Q again. So again, I'll delete history and I will rotate this 90 degrees. So if you just do it manually, you cannot really guess where it should be. So I would just um, enter it here, 90 degrees. And that is fine. So this is becoming pretty unreadable. And I'm going to show you a few ways of how to make that readable again. So first of all, you can go into shading and say wireframe on top of shaded. So if you show that, you can also see your wireframe. Um, so you can see how many edges your model has. You can also turn that off again. It's also all into the buttons at the top here. Um, so you can toggle them on and off. You can also look at only the wireframe. Um, all right, so we have our little wheel. Exciting. 
Another way of doing it is generating a little bit of shadow into your viewport, which you can do by going to rendering at the top here and then selecting your viewport 2.0 settings with the box next to it. And you just uh, go to screen space ambient occlusion. So ambient occlusion is more like a contact shadow. It's the shadow into the creases of your objects. Um, you can also edit the amount and the radius, which is also making this a bit more readable. Um, then another thing we can, so now we can simply duplicate this wheel. I will shift drag the whole shape so I can see now two cylinders here. Now I can select both of these cylinders and again, um, I can shift drag them here and just make sure that they are pressed against it. And now I have my first card. I can still, of course, move these ones around. Maybe this is better at the back. Um, something like that. So you now have five different shapes and I can select all of them in my editor here, but I want to, this to be one thing that I can just select. So what I'll do is select all of these, make sure they are all selected and I will shift, right click and combine all of them. So combining them will actually make these into one object. So as you can see, P cylinder five here is now everything. Um, I also have some residue, history, leftovers, just things that I do not want in here, but I will now delete history again. So what I'm gonna do is edit, delete all by type, and I'm going to delete history. So now they're all gone. So instead of just going in, uh, selecting an object and going into edit, delete by type history, we have now chosen delete all by type and then going into history, which is going to do that for your entire scene, which is even more thorough than the first option. Awesome. So I'm also going to double click on this one and I'm going to call it cart one. And the cool thing is I can now duplicate my cart one just by shift and clicking it and duplicating it. Um, so I'll select my both my cards now and I'll push them to the back just because I want them still visible and I want to use them as a size reference for this shape right here. Alrighty, let's get into the creation of this top part here. Um, I will again start off with a cube. Um, so I'll just start with this cube with the open windows here. Um, I am going to edit this in my channel box. I will just put equal values because I kind of want this to be cubical. So 20. And what I'm going to do is give my subdivision each three sides. So this is what it should look like. It's kind of like a Rubik's cube. Um, I'm going to go into edge mode and I'm simply going to select some edges. So two of these ones, and I'm going to scale them so that they go to the edge more. So here as well, select one and two by pressing shift. And I'm going to scale only using one direction, just so that they are pushed to the edges more. So repeat the step again. Should look like this. And now I will go into face mode and I will delete these bigger faces because I kind of want them to be windows. 
And what I will do now is a thing that we've done before. It's selecting our open borders. So I'm going to edge mode again. I will select this one by double clicking it and I will shift, move it inside, move it inwards so that it looks like this. So let me repeat that step. I select this by double clicking and I perform shifts, bring it inwards. And that's the thing that I will do for all sides. So double click, shift, move it with an arrow. And in this case, now that I have two sides, they will kind of come closely together in the edges here, which is what we want. So now again, shift, bring it inwards. And that is what, what it should look like. So they kind of touching in the middle here, but not quite. Um, so it's not perfect yet. I will now fix that. I will go into right click vertex mode. So yeah. I will go into vertex mode and I will select these two vertices and I will shift right click and say merge vertices and again, merge vertices. So you'll have to slide twice. Let me show that again. Um, shift, right click, merge, and then merge again. So then they become one. Um, if this is a, a thing that I have to do throughout my whole mesh, I will use the G button again. So the G is my repeat tool. I will select those two and press G. So this only works if the uh, merge vertices was my last use tool. So I'll just select both of them, press G. And again, I can use F to focus on these two verts, press G. And that way that should speed up the process quite a bit. So G. So G should work. It's a standard shortcut for everyone. Um, unless you already have changed some of those shortcuts, then it will not work. And now we're going to do something that we've seen before. We're going to select these edges, opposite open edges, and we're going to bridge these. Bottom as well. Pressing G to bridge them again. Awesome. And this is what you should end up with. There's probably 20 different ways of creating this. This is just the way I've done it now to show you some of these uh, tools. Um, but there's probably more optimized ways of doing that. Um, right, moving on. I'm going to make this bottom side a bit larger. So I will select this bottom face. And if you want to grow the amount of faces that you've selected, you can press shift. So shift and the is larger than button is going to allow you to select more of these. So larger than, smaller than, they both work. Um, which can be so quick in selection. Um, and now I can move this whole thing downwards. Again, you can just select this manually. If you know how to optimize your workflow, it's going to be so rewarding. If you really be strict to trust, if you really make yourself know all these shortcuts and it's gonna make you work a lot faster. Um, so there's also a bit of an edge here. So I'm going to insert edge tool again. Voila. And I'm going to select these faces. And I will not move them downwards. I will shift drag them downwards just so that I create new faces. And again, you can move the vertices around a bit to just make it match like that. So now we're going to create these rounded off edges and I will simply do that by creating new geometry and then moving stuff around. So what I'll do is I'll show it. Um, I'll select these ones and I'll do again a connect tool. Um, I still have it put to two segments, so that's great. I press Q. So I'll do it for the top ones as well. Connect to Q. And in here, 
I will just make one connect components. I mean connect two and I'll just make it one again. Press Q. And now I can select some of these edges here. So I'll select these three and I will just gently nudge them downwards to creating a little bit of a curvature. I'll do it here as well. So I'm repeating that step, just selecting them, bringing them into a curve. can do that for these ones as well. You can create it a bit by nudging them to the side. Of course, upwards, it's not gonna give me a great result, so I'll just leave it like that for now. Sometimes you'll have to zoom in to select the right parts. Alrighty. So this is what you should have right now. Something like that. It's also not centered. Um, bad, bad me. So I'll put that to zero again. I will delete the history. And I think I'll just move on by creating the nose of this with this geometry that I have already. Okay, I will just select all of this and I will bring it forward. So it's still a bit thick, so I'm going to insert an edge again here at the front. And now I will select these three faces and move it downwards. And I feel like we can just create the bottom part here in the middle um, by using some of these. So I'll select these. Okay, not all of them. I will select these ones. I will leave this open just to have a little bit of negative space. And now again, I will shift drag downwards. If you want to copy stuff, you always have to press shift. So now it's kind of like I created a box at the bottom, um, but I will still make it a bit smaller. So I'll select these faces. And if I now downscale them in this way, I get some more space for my wheels. So let's create a, oh, it's a pipe. So let's create a pipe. Let's rotate it 90 degrees. Copy it, copy it to the other side. You know, I'll actually create a sphere for the front part as well. So what I'll do is rotate this, um, I'll rotate this 90 degrees. And then I'll select a ring 
and just going with my shift and my larger than sign i have no idea what it's called so <laughs> and now i'll just move this okay i know it's not perfect i'd actually have to add in an edge here So let's so one less right and now I can just pull that outwards by all means this is not terrific geometry but it's a base and that's already good. <laughs> so let's delete this part as well, as well. And instead of bridging, you can also just fill an entire part oh, because now it has way more edges than um, two opponent edges. So I'll shift right click and then there's this really nice option called fill hole. And now I can connect these verts again. Just make sure that you count quads. Um, so I'll select these verts and I'll do uh, connect connect components and now I'll just complete the tool by using G so you don't have to follow this along it will already work if you don't fix this if I'm going too fast I would say take your time for this um, and now I can just move that my translate X can be zero. And I will move these verts just to create a longer shape like that. <laughs> and it's starting to look like, like my train. <laughs> Um, for the front part, you can just create another box. So cube. This one's fairly easy. You just center it. It's too much center. I just center it. And then I'll just play around with my vertices to create the same effect as is here. So I just go by selecting verts. So just selecting, selecting and moving so that it kind of starts to look like your reference. Um, always double check which ones you have selected. Like that. And to finish it off, I'm just going to put a cylinder on the top. That's an email. So cylinder at the top, I'm going to make it lower in subdivisions because it's not a big object. And now I can actually just add some edges with the insert edge tool. And now selecting some of these verts and I'll just simply scale them up or down. Like that. And again, I will select all of my shapes here. I will delete all by type history. And I'm going to shift right click and combine them. So that they have become one shape. And then again, delete all by type history. So all this residue information is now gone and I just have three parts. We can even go further and duplicate these cards just by shift and dragging them with one of these buttons. You can just uh, make the longest train ever. 
What we can also do is create a ground plane for this. So I'm going to shift right click and create a plane. So click and drag underneath this. I'll make it a bit larger like that. So I have my ground plane and all of my train elements. Um, so let's do something about the very boring grayish color here. Um, I can quickly give them a flat color. Um, I just have to assign something called materials to them. Um, so let's go into our attribute editor. So for now, you've only seen the channel box um, slash layer editor, this one. But we also have an other menu, which we will use a lot in uh, Maya. So it is the attribute editor. So you can pull it up by pressing, I think it's, Okay, so the shortcut for this is Ctrl A. And this is the attribute editor. And usually it is docked here in one of those three tabs. So you can just click and drag it here. And now you can just cycle between these three and go to the attribute editor. You can also, if that didn't work, you can just dock it somewhere here. Just as long as it's visible, that's okay. I prefer to have it in one of these three tabs, so I'll just put it here. And now if I select my plane, which is my ground plane, I see I have five different tabs for that here. Um, so in the first one, you have some general settings, so you have your translation settings, um, but it goes deeper and deeper into the shape. Um, that sounds a bit abstract. Um, but let me explain it a little bit further. Uh, then you have the plane shape. Um, so these are separate little settings that you can perform on this shape here. Then you can go even deeper. Your polyplane itself, uh, you can edit some subdivisions. Um, and then even the deepest form here is the shading group and the shader itself. So when you hear about a shader, it usually is about the color or the texture on your model. So shaders, uh, materials, um, <clears throat> anything like that, you, then you know it's about the coloring of your object. Um, so you can select this. We're in our Lambert 1 shader, which is the standard shader that is applied always. When you just start modeling and you haven't done, you haven't applied any shader, it would always start out with the Lambert shader. Um, but we can change the settings in here. So seeing as it's our first Lambert shader it is actually applied to all of these different objects. So if I change the color here, I will change for everything. So we can make it the meanest magenta or you can actually choose any color here, whatever you prefer. Um, it's going to be applied to all of the objects, which is not that useful actually. So I'm just going to bring it back to a lighter tone and I will make my train a different shader. So how are we going to do that? Um, I'm going to select all my train objects. You can do that here, but you can also select all the cards in your outliner. And what I'm going to do is I'm not going to press any buttons, but I'm simply going to right click and I'm going to use the drop down menu to cycle to assign new material. So <clears throat> simply right clicking, assign new material, and that will pop up this screen here. And now we can assign a new Lambert shader. It's the third one here, Lambert. So let's click that. And now it's um, a different color from our ground plane. So now this Lambert 2 in my attribute editor, I can also change the color. So now I can just choose which color my train has. Um, but let's practice this a little bit. Uh, you can actually assign different colors for all of these cards. So let me just demonstrate it again. I can select some of these. I will right click, assign new material. And again, this menu will pop up for me. It's popping up on my secret second screen. Um, and now you can again choose a Lambert, 
select color and move the slider so it has a different color. So now you have some different colors here. <clears throat> this can be fun uh, for indicating which prop is which. Um, these are just basic colors. You will probably never ever use them when you're in production because then you will use some uh, other kind of um, other kinds of shaders really. So for now, it's really nice for like color coding your objects. Um, can be helpful uh, for selecting them as well. Um, but now you know how to assign some different colors to this. There's of course a way deeper and more elaborate explanation to this. There's also a whole menu in creating and editing these. It's called the hypershade. So if you want to uh, mess around with your shaders further, you can click this uh, blue ball at the top here and that will open your shader library. And in here you can also select all your shaders and you can edit them. So uh, let's put this to a sphere. So this is kind of a preview of how it will look like in the end. Um, you can also in here, well, you can do that as actually, as you can see, your hypershade settings are quite the same as the ones in your uh, attribute editor. So you don't always have to go all the way here, um, but you can also edit the transparency, making it a little bit see-through as you can see. Uh, this can also be very useful to work with if you really want to see um, which uh, faces are, or planes are lying on top of each other. It might give you a better view of that. Um, so you can do it in Lambert under transparency settings here. Um, then you have some other fun settings um, like ambient color. I would suggest to play around with it because, of course, the more you play around with this software, the easily it will come to you afterwards. Um, all right, we have some cute colors. Now let's um, also add some lights in our scene because if we do not have any lights, we also will not be able to render things. Um, so rendering, uh, the whole settings for the rendering, they are next to the hypershade setting. So right next, left next to it. So it says display render settings. Let's click that one. And here are my render settings. Um, so it's divided into five tabs. You have the common tab. This is where you apply your file size. Um, so you can here select, for instance, like a, a higher quality. Say that you want a, an HD image, which is 1920 on 1080 pixels. Uh, but you can choose anything. It, it's not really, it doesn't really matter right now. Um, if you choose a lower one, it's of course going to render faster because it's lower quality, needs less calculation time. Um, but let's let's go for a good one. So I'm going to choose the one eight, uh, 1080. And then in the second tab, you'll find your on you'll find your Arnold renderer settings. Um, so you have your camera samples. So these camera samples here, this roughly translate to the quality of your render setting, your render settings. So the camera AA here, these are like the general settings and everything underneath that will follow the camera AA samples. So the higher this is, uh, the higher your samples will be entirely. This will be a multiplier for all the ones below, which is also going to make your render time higher. So be careful with the camera AA samples um, as they will make a significant difference in your render times. Um, but I just realized I'm really explaining rendering, but maybe some of you don't even know what rendering is yet. But let's just show that visually. Um, if I now go into my render tab, so it's actually the take sign with an I in it here. Uh, if I click that, I have my render view, which is this. And I can click the take here and that will render my frame. And it will probably render black because I do not have any lights. So that's entirely dark, which is not what we wanted. Um, we're going to create some lights. So I'm going to go to Arnold's lights 
and I'm going to say sky dome which creates this whole mesh in the back here um, so the sky dome is here right now it is an Arnold light um, let's also create a non Arnold light um, you can find that under create lights and let's go for a directional light so I've clicked it so it pops up here and now I can move that one around so let's make it a bit larger so making it larger will not change the the light it will not become larger it's just this logo that will be larger so we have our directional lights and that are two lights um, so quickly to explain them sky dome light is like a global light um, this will kind of mimic a cloudy overcast day it doesn't really have directional sunlight um, this is a very soft light it you will not be able to tell uh, which direction the the light is coming from because it's kind of everywhere um, and the second one the directional light is really a clear direction you can see that this is pointing in a direction so that is also like the direction that the light will follow obviously um, so this is kind of more like a sunlight so i will combine the two um, because that will give me a very natural look uh, and right now i can try to render this again that's basically what it does it slowly calculates the light into the shape here um, and this is the final result so just to reiterate uh, on the two lights um, so the sky dome will give you these really soft shadows and the directional light is the one that gives you these really harsh shadow lines that really make it come from one direction um, so that's the difference between the two So if you want to see what you're going to render, you can also uh, toggle on one of these same save frames here. So it's that logo here at the top. You can click it and that will give you a frame. And then that way you can position your train a whole lot better. So it takes a while because I'm rendering in a very high quality. It's my uh, full HD settings. And again, you can clearly indicate my directional shadows, which is this outline here in the front. And my, uh, my sky dome lights is the soft shadows on the bottom here. Uh, also the soft shadows actually in between the creases everywhere. It's kind of an ambient occlusion shadow. Um, so yeah, that's that. <clears throat> Um, to save this file, that might be cool as well. Maybe you can show off your first creation <laughs> to someone. So you can file, go to file, the drop down, save image, press that. And then you can just save it anywhere you like. Um, just a very important remark is when you save it, it's going to look a little bit darker if you save it as a raw image. Um, so what you do is save this as a color managed image and it will look exactly the same as it does here in your render view so don't forget while you save turn on the color managed image because otherwise it will be a little bit darker than what you see here um, all right i think that was it for today um, i hope you will learn something new uh, i hope you can start practicing a little bit i would say start with some really simple simple props, um, start fiddling around and use the marking menus a lot because they will help you speed up the process so much. So I hope you learned something new today and good luck with it. Bye.